Once again, we want to thank you for tuning in to Crossings, a ministry of Calvary Baptist Church. I'm Pastor Dwight Lapine, and I'll be your host this morning as we get started in teaching you what the Bible says, not only about eternal life, but how to get to know God daily, moment by moment, in a personal way. We trust that this connection would really help you have a peace and a joy as you come to know Him and believe in Him. Mark chapter 8, 27 to the end of the chapter. Jesus went with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi, and on the road he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they answered, John the Baptist, others Elijah, still others, one of the prophets. And Jesus said, but you? And he asked them again, who do you say that I am? And Peter answered him, well, you are the Messiah. And he strictly warned them to tell no one about him. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man would suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes, be killed and rise after three days. He was openly talking about this and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. And turning around and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and he said, get behind me, Satan, because you are not thinking about God's concerns, but man's. And summoning the crowd along with his disciples, Jesus said to them, if anyone wants to be my follower, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life because of me and the gospel will save it. For what does it benefit a man to gain the whole world and yet lose his life? What can a man gain or give in exchange for his life? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words... In this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will also be ashamed of him when he comes in glory of his Father with the holy angels. Have you ever been uh, so focused on something of interest that you, you missed uh, something more important and more significant, more amazing that was going on around you, you missed it because you were so intently focused on something of interest. I, a number of years ago, I uh, was getting ready for a, a wilderness trip. I was taking a group of uh, men, leaders from a church down in Iowa, and we were going on a, on a wilderness trip. And before that trip, somebody gave me uh, a little device. And this little device is called a, it was called a Garmin 72. There's a picture of the actual uh, device. And uh, it's a little personal navigation device. Tells you where to go. You can track log points as you go along on your trek because it reads the coordinates. Uh, has a little digital compass on there to point where you're going, but it has a, you know, elevation. Shows you uh, where you're at and, and uh, the coordinates as you move along. And you can track little log points as you get to different points. I said, Man, this is kind of cool. So I have this little device along with me. And this, is, this one didn't have, a, doesn't have topography. It doesn't have the show you where any lakes or any, uh, you know, elevation lines are or anything. I mean, it, what I was looking at was just a little screen and a little set of little track marks that would, you know, breadcrumb trail, you know, right across the thing. I'm like, well, you know, it's kind of neat or whatever. We get to a point and uh, I was in the front of the canoe and, and uh, moving along and, and hey, look at that. There's a beaver. Oh man, that's so cool. Yeah, that is, hold on, hold on just a second. I pull out my little device and track point. Um, and then you can see how the little display on there doesn't have like a, num a keypad or QWERTY keyboard. It has just the little uh, device. So to get to type in beaver, it's uh, over, over, B, over, over, over. E over, over, or A. So, I, you know, I'm punching in beaver. You know, it takes forever just to get the word beaver in there. So cool. And, they, you know, wasn't that so cool to see that beaver? Yeah, that was really cool to see that beaver. That was really neat. You're moving along the breadcrumb trails on the things a little bit more, you know, a little further. Hey, look, there's a waterfall. Oh, that waterfall. That is so cool. Hold on, hold on just a second. Could you canoe, could just keep the canoe straight for just a little bit here? Just, just a second, you know. Uh, w. Okay, A. Look at that waterfall. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. Just a second. A, T. Yeah. You know, and you're punching waterfall in on the little device. And you think, you know, and I hear this little voice that can, in my head. Look, look where you are. Look where you are. And I say, I am looking where I am. Look at this. This is cool. It shows a little breadcrumb trail right here. I can see, I can see right where I'm at on this thing. And if I ever wanted to know how to get back to the beaver, I could, I could push this little button right here, go to beaver. And it would take me right back to where the beaver was. And, and I thought, no, look where you are. Look where you are. I am looking where I am. Look at this. This is cool. And you say, well, this is really silly because he's saying, look where you are. 
put the dumb thing down and look where you are, right? Look at you are out in the middle of God's wilderness and God's country. Put the stupid thing away, right? <laughs> Forget the device and look where you are. Look where you are. I don't know if you've ever been in a position like that where things have happened, you know, Niall keeps us on our toes, man. He's just, if I'm not paying attention or Anna's not paying attention, he is, he's got a creative little mind and he is off doing something I don't even know. What's he doing right now? No, no I don't know. What's he doing? You know, where is he? What's going on? He is, he is just so quick and, uh, and creative with some of the things you want. And you have to like pay attention to the things that are going on around you. And I oftentimes reflect on the number of decisions that I make every day that kind of orient my vision. Where am I going? Every little decision that we make every single day, it snowballs. It creates a, a pattern, a breadcrumb trail of the things that are going on in life. And I start to think about all those little decisions that I make. For what cause? For whom did I make that decision? Who does that little decision benefit? And my struggle is that I oftentimes make decisions every day in order to make life easier. I make decisions to uh, make life a little bit more efficient. I make, make decisions so that I can attempt to even prevent harm or, or make sure that I ensure some mode of safety. I make decisions because I, I'm concerned about what other people think or I want to save face. I make decisions because I want to live healthier and, and maybe by living, eating these things, you know, my, I would guarantee that my life would, would be longer, right? Or, or I make decisions because there's something that I want to obtain, something that I, that I would like to have or possess. And listen, I, I know the principles of stewardship. I, I know that many decisions every day along the line can be made and indeed must be made for the glory of God as we take a look at the decisions that we made. And I understand the principles of stewardship, but my dilemma is that there comes a point in my life where I know that I have crossed the line. Where if I'm completely honest with myself, I'm not thinking about God's concerns. I'm thinking about how is this going to benefit me? How does this help me? How does this make my life easier, more efficient, more safe? Have I looked beyond this life? And do I even have the, the courage to look down the road and, and into the future, not even for my own security, not even for the future of my family, but, but for the future of, of generations of people that embrace Christ or that do not know Christ even, that they would come to glorify my Father which is in heaven. And I think the battleground that all of us face Every one of us face this battleground every day. It's in, the, it's in the everyday decisions and expectations that we have. Everyday decisions and expectations. It's not the big decisions of life. It's the everyday little focal point decisions that develop habits. They develop patterns of thinking in our lives that, that pave the way for larger decisions of life. If you practice in the small decisions of life and you develop those habits of thinking in the small decisions of life, the big decisions aren't a big deal because God has already directed you. He's shown you. He, he paves that way for you. But we are indeed in this battleground. We are indeed at war with our minds trying to figure out why do I make some of the decisions that I'm, why do I have the expectations that I have? We are indeed at war. Chess has been called one of the greatest war games ever invented. <laughs> I'm not a huge chess fan, but maybe there are some of you out here that are. 64 squares on a little board, right? 32 pieces. And the game's complexity boggles the mind. Mathematicians have calculated the number of unique games that could be played in a game of chess. The answer, 10 to the 120th power. That is more than the number of atoms in the known observable, observable universe, which is approximately 10 to 81. Considering the staggering possibilities that are inherent in that game, some would believe that playing chess could possibly lead to insanity. In fact, 
there is an addiction that many, many would encounter as you enrapture yourself in. Maybe it's not chess, maybe it's some other game, but, but you can get incredibly consumed with a passion for playing or engaging in something. The passion for playing chess is the most absorbing of occupations, the least satisfying of desires, an aimless excrescence upon life. It annihilates a man. H.G. Wells is an English writer who writes in history and political writings and uh, writings of war. But he said that it indeed could annihilate a man. In, in the year A.D. 813, there was a succession struggle between two brothers, Muhammad Alamim and his brother Alamam, Alamim and Alamam. Okay, I'll see if I can keep my tongue from getting twisted here through this story. But the two brothers are in this struggle for the uh, for the uh, the uh, Abbasid Empire. They want to, and and the forces of of uh, Alamam are waging war and moving into the city, uh, besieging upon uh, Abbasid, which is the capital of Baghdad. And he advances, his, gathers his forces together. al gathers his forces together. Starts moving through the streets up towards the palace walls. And he's, he's uh, street by street, just moving through this place. And, and it's under attack as he's moving up here. But within the palace walls, his brother, al is engaged in a battle as well. But he's not engaged in trying to figure out what to do about his brother who's coming to take his life. He's engaged in a game of chess with his favorite eunuch, Kathur. And a medieval historian writes, uh, a messenger bursts through the doors and, and tries to warn him of the approaching enemy, his brother. He says, O oh, commander of the faithful, this is not time to play. Pray arise and arise. Attend to the matters of a more serious moment. But he might as well have been light years away. <laughs> have patience, my friend, the caliph calmly replies. I see that in a few moves, I shall have Kathur in checkmate. <laughs> And a few moments later, he indeed does. He has Kathur in checkmate, but it is too late. For the doors of the castle are stormed, and in comes his brother and the army, and al is swiftly beheaded, and his brother al takes the Abbasid Empire. H.G. Wells was right. Chess can annihilate a man. To be so enraptured, to be so absorbed, so focused, so determined, and I wonder today, I just wonder today if we find ourselves so absorbed, so focused, so enraptured and determined to see something happen that our vision happens to be a little bit blurred with some of the bigger things of greater importance that God might be doing and orchestrating in and through our lives. And like al in his game of chess, I wonder if if the game, if, if the life situations that we are so intensely wrapped up in is not the game that we are supposed to be mindful of. I wonder if maybe even we have engaged ourselves in the wrong game. I have one life to live. <laughs> I have one life on this earth to live and I do not want to waste it. I do not want to waste the life that God has given to me. And the thought for today is to be mindful of the game that you are playing. Because once you have spent your life, you cannot buy it back. Once you have spent this life, it is gone. And what are we living for? To what cause do we make the decisions that we make every day? To what benefit? And in the passage that we are in, engaged in here in Mark chapter 8, even the disciples come to a point of confusion. See, because for the disciples, life was looking up for them. As they made the decision to, to forget their jobs and to follow Jesus, the crowds were flocking to see this miracle man and all the amazing things that he was doing. Life was really starting to look positive. I mean, the, can, can you imagine being one of the disciples? Man, this is so cool. We are, we are, we are with, there is something really big happening here and we're, we have the inside circle. We're with this man. I mean, he is doing amazing things and we are a part of something really big. I mean, isn't that what we all want? I mean, we want to do things that are of significance. We want to be a part of something that is bigger than ourselves, something that is more transcendent than our own lives. And these disciples are looking at what's happening and they're saying, this is amazing. But in the passage here, 
they're confronted with what I'm calling a game changer. (laughs) Jesus confronts them in their thoughts about life. And in our passage here, they, they, Jesus opens up this window to start to see the bigger picture of what they're supposed to be seeing. And I'm going to call it phases of this game. Four phases that I want to walk through this morning. Phase one, we're going to look at the identification quickly. Phase two, we're going to look at the objective. Phase three of this life game is the game change, the question that Jesus poses. And then phase four is, okay, what is the strategy? What are we really supposed to be focused on here? The morning. So the first one is phase one, which is our identification. And we were looking at, at uh, verses 27 through 30. And I read over them with you already. As the disciples are following him, Jesus asked two questions. And the first question that he asked was, who do people say that I am? Now, normally that would be a very proud question for somebody to ask. But in this case, the Messiah is asking this question and it really does matter, doesn't it? who a person believes Jesus to be. What kind of a Messiah is this man? Who is he? Is he indeed even the Messiah? Who is this man? And then he directed his attention at the disciples. Those have already made the decision to follow him. He directs his attention at them to a deeper level of commitment. And he says, you, but you, who do you say that I am? And the confession of the disciples would be an important marker in this passage to claim and to admit that they see indeed that Jesus is in fact the Messiah, the Son of God, God himself in the flesh. And I wonder today, have you received Jesus? To you, Who is Jesus? Do you know Jesus as your Savior? Could you say 100% for sure, beyond a shadow of a doubt, I know Jesus as my Savior. I know that I am on my way to heaven. It is not based upon my deeds or my works because I have placed my faith and trust in Jesus and what he did upon the cross of Calvary for me. Now see, the disciples don't understand any of this yet. But I'm asking you today, if you indeed know, do you know Jesus? And the reason I ask that at the beginning of this is because this passage is about those that are following Jesus. It is, it is directing us to a deeper understanding of who Jesus is. And so that identification phase who is on the team here? Who is playing the game? Who am I, who am I in this chess match, match with? Right? Who, who's with me? Who do you say that I am? Jesus asks. And then he opens up and the declaration that he makes and what he opens up to them and teaches them starts to help them understand exactly the objective and that's phase two. The objective is here. What, what are we trying to accomplish Because there seems to be some confusion among the disciples. And Jesus says to them, tell no one. I don't want you to tell anybody because if you announce the deity and messiahship too quickly, it would accelerate events too too fast. And the son of man, he says, must suffer, must be rejected, must be killed. And three days later, he will rise from the dead. Jesus is not using symbolic language as he has done in the past. He's not using little parables or illish. He is speaking very clearly to these individuals. And he speaks clearly enough that Peter gets really concerned about what has just been said. He's really concerned and he rebukes Jesus for what he says. And he's, wait, what a second, wait a second here. What is going on? What just happened? We thought that we had the upper hand. We we took an incredible risk to follow this man, Jesus. And you're trying to tell me that that you're going to die? I don't understand this. The king is going to put himself in checkmate? Why are you doing this? What is happening? And he rebukes Jesus and Jesus corrects him and rebukes him back. And it's very interesting to me that Jesus uses the same words to rebuke Peter as he did when he confronted Satan in the great temptation in the wilderness in Matthew chapter four. Do you remember the appeal that Satan made to Jesus and the three appeals to hunger, to security, and to authority? 
to hunger that he would make the stones into bread, to security that he would cast him down from the pinnacle of the temple and, and have the illusion of being rescued from, uh, from suffering and from danger, and to the aspect of authority, all the kingdoms of the world, that he would have power, provision, possession, and power. And Jesus used the same rebuke to Peter that he did to Satan. I find it interesting because all three of these ideas, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, parallel the ideas of John chapter two, 1 John chapter 2, 15 through 17 that we looked at a couple of weeks ago. And John's admission to us, it fits like a glove. It's the same concept, the same three ideas that you and I are all lured into as we try to satisfy the desires of the flesh, the lust of our eyes, the pride of life. The, the things that my, my flesh wants to have, the things that my eyes want to see, the things that I work hard to obtain in this life. And they are all natural desires of the life. But John says, do not love the world or the things of this world. Do not. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life are passing. The lust of this world is passing away. It's going to be gone, right? It's going to disappear. Do not invest your life in satisfying these aspects. Hunger, security, authority. It's a waste. It's absolutely a waste. And yet those temptations that, that were, were being directed at were temptations that were, were very real to us as humans. They, they, they seem to satisfy the inherent desires of our bodies, of our eyes, of the things that we want to accomplish in life. Edersheim says, these temptations are all the more dangerous that they appeal to the purely human. <laughs> The element in us which arise from circumstance are prompted by an affection that has regard to the purely human. And its one-sided intenseness minds the things of man and not the things of God. And I just ask today, are you mindful of God's concerns or of man's concerns? Whose agenda are we truly concerned with here? Peter was not just concerned about what was happening to Jesus. Peter is concerned because to follow Jesus meant he would have to go where Jesus went. If he takes a cross, if Jesus takes a cross, Peter would have to take a cross. <laughs> and not only that, but the implications of the, and the expectations that they had of who Jesus was were, were just very confusing to the disciples. Why? Because it meant that the expectations that they had of who Jesus would be, he would be the military conqueror. He would come in and restore the, to political power the Jews and their land. This is what Jesus was supposed to do. He was supposed to come in and restore everything and secure everything the way that we have been promised that it would happen. And two chapters later in Mark chapter 10, they're walking along with Jesus and two of the disciples continue to ask. They're not getting it. They say, we have a favor to ask Jesus. Could, in your kingdom, could one of us sit at your right hand and the other at your left hand? <laughs> Wait, and Jesus says, no, no, no. There are some that ascribe to power. There are some that want to, to live this life to try and gain power and influence and, and, uh, and please the people and to have prestige. But, but that is not for you, he said in, in Mark chapter 10 and verse 43. It is not for you to be like them among them. Even in Acts chapter 1, Peter is still asking the question, are you now going to restore the kingdom? <laughs> That they are really after and their hopes are that Jesus would rise to political power, secure their future, secure their land. And indeed, I'm telling you, he will. But not in the way that they're expecting. Not in the way that they have expected it to happen. Friends, you and I are no different than the disciples. We expect God to do things for our benefit, for, for our lives right now. We ask him for financial provision. We ask him for safety. And, and I, I agree, those things are very important to ask for. And you can indeed ask God for financial provision, for safety. But I ask you, we dare not expect them or demand them because what happens when we expect and demand those things of God? What happens when they, when they fall through? What happens when those things do not come our way? Is God any less God? Is he less in control? Because things do not happen the way that we expect for them to happen. 
God has a different perspective for us. He has a very different mindset than the way in which we tend to live our lives. And phase three is indeed the game changer here. What does it benefit a man? If he spends his life to gain the whole world and yet loses his life. The words of Jesus are a lesson to all of us. And his rebuke to Peter is a rebuke to us. You are not thinking about God's concerns, but man's. At some point, friends, we cross the line of being concerned with God's concerns to being concerned with our own benefits. And you can spend your life focused on the things that secure this life, or you can be focused on the things of eternal value. But once you spend your life, you cannot buy it back. Once you invest your life, you cannot get it back. We invest to the future with the hopes of gaining something sooner rather than later. We invest to the future with the hopes of gaining ease and comfort. We invest to the future with the hopes of being able to control certain outcomes and uh, circumstances or to solve certain problems. And we take risks because we want the outcome to benefit us. And you say, Logan, this is all stewardship. I mean, we have to be good stewards. I understand the principles of stewardship. I get that. (laughs) I'm just saying this morning, it is for us as individuals to evaluate. Nobody can judge this for anybody else, but it is for you and me to evaluate and to say, there is a point in time when I am crossing the line, when I am not concerned about I might say I'm concerned about God's things. I might look to others that I'm concerned with the things of God. But what is going on in here? Am I really truly evaluating the motives of why I do the things that I do each day? The little decisions that I make every single day. What do I find my security in? What do I do to protect my losses? What kinds of things would I do to keep safe from per- and protect those losses to keep from losing those things? What kinds of precautions do I make and investments do I make of time and money and resources to protect those things because I'm afraid that I might lose them or lose control of them or that I might gain something that I hope to be able to gain? John Piper in his book, Don't Waste Your Life, calls it the mirage of safety. It's a mirage. Because we cannot guarantee these things. We can invest into these things, investments that we make because we only hope. We only hope that they would keep us safe. We only hope that they will buy us more time, that they will give us better benefits for us and for our kids. But they're not guaranteed investments. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't make those investments. I'm not saying that. I'm asking us to evaluate. Are we mindful of God's concerns or our concerns? What is our heart's agenda? Whose concerns are we really concerned about? Be mindful. Be mindful of what game you are playing because once you have spent your life, you cannot buy it back. I don't have time, but Jesus' words parallel those of Psalm chapter 49. It is an amazing passage, and maybe I will save that for our time in the second service after our soup today. Psalm 49 is a wonderful passage to take a look at. But for clarity's sake, I want to help you to understand when you look at that passage that it is possible to manage political structures. It is possible to manage money. It is possible to manage your time in ways that are mindful of God's concerns. And the last verse of, that, of Psalm 49 says, because to, those, to do it without understanding is where the problem lies. To do it without understanding. And I want to be doing it with understanding. I want to be mindful of the things that God has asked me to do and how I'm investing my life. And I just asked this question this morning. What if, what if the apparent loss or checkmate of the king is not actually the end of the game. (laughs) Jesus has just announced to the disciples his death. And they're not seeing it clearly. Death to them means death. But what if it's not the end of the game? What if the game that you and I are so intensely wrapped up in is not the one that we are supposed to be focused on? And that's why Jesus presents to us a fourth strategy. The the new strategy, phase four, lose your life for a greater cause. Lose your life for something that is worth losing it for, for something that's worth investing it in. Jesus said, if you are to follow me, you are to deny yourself, 
to take up your cross and to follow me. And we are confronted with a contrast of philosophies. We want glory without suffering. We want glory without the pain of enduring and going through things. That's Satan's philosophy. Glory without suffering. But God is trying to help us to understand that we are, we are to suffer for his name's sake and for his glory and that that suffering will be transformed into glory. 1 Peter 5, but as may the God of grace who called us by his eternal glory in Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, you would be perfect and established and strengthened and settled. <laughs> Do you see it? Do you see it? Lose your life. It's worth the risk. Life is full of risks. Risks imply ignorance. We have risk because we are ignorant of what will happen tomorrow. That's why we have to take risks. We cannot avoid risks. We always take risks. The question is, to whose benefit do we take the risks? To whose benefit are we risking the investments, the life that we have, the resources that we have? What happens in a game of chess if you merely play chess with the objective of trying to keep all of your pieces safe from harm? What happens? You don't have a game. <coughs> what if we take in our lives, we take the painful loss of the pawn because later on it will work to the benefit of the king. It will work to, to the glory of the king. Take the risk for what is his glory. Not for my comforts, not for my gain, not for me, but for his glory alone. You look at the Old Testament stories of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and the faith and the risks that they took, right? Do you remember their words? God, he can rescue us from the fire, furnace of this blazing fire, and he can rescue us from the power of you, the king. But even if he does not, you say, What? They don't know what's going to happen, but their faith and their confidence for the cause of their God and their king is worth risking their life for. And they have the utmost confidence that God will continue to take care of them. And the tragic hypocrisy that is, that is this, it's the enchantment, the enchantment of security that takes risks every day for ourselves, but paralyzes us from taking risk for others on the road to Calvary. We are deluded and think that it may jeopardize a security in the fact that in fact does not even exist. A security that does not exist. We take risks for things that are mirages. They are just illusions of things that we think might be safe <laughs> to take a risk. Missionary by the name of Jay Tucker, November 1964. There was anarchy that broke out in the Belgian Congo and this man, Tucker, his hands are tied behind his back. And with a number of other Christian companions, he is brutally beaten. The Congo rebels had captured them and, and were beating them with sticks and clubs and bottles, broken uh, glass bottles. And Tucker, still alive, is thrown into the Bomakonde River to be eaten alive by crocodiles. Risk, Tucker's risk was not an uncalculated risk. His friend on the way in said, listen, Tucker, don't go. I plead with you, don't go. You're risking your life for this. To which Tucker replied, God didn't tell me I had to come out. He only told me I had to go in. Two days after the attack, paratroopers come in and rescue his family and pull his family back out. And Tucker's wife in the air, in the plane, on the way out, praise this prayer. Father, we thank you for your goodness and your love and your many blessings. We love thee and praise thee for thy care. And through these many difficult days, thou hast watched over us and kept us. And we ask that you take Jay's life, which has been laid down, and use it in death for thine honor and glory. For 30 years, it seemed like Tucker's sacrifice was for nothing. The Bamakande River flows right in the middle of an unreached people group called the Mangbetu tribe. And when times of civil unrest became difficult for the Mangbetu tribe, the Mangbetu king sent for help. And he sent for, he sent for help, not knowing what kind of help would come. Who would be sent his way but a policeman? But not any policeman. This policeman was a man that had been led to Jesus by a man named Tucker two months before Tucker died. 
This policeman comes in and he begins to try and attempt to share his faith in Jesus Christ with the, with the Mengbetu tribe. And he has difficulty trying to do that until he encounters and discovers an ancient tribal tradition. And that ancient traditional tribal tradition was inscribed and it said, it said this, if the blood of any man flows in the, in the Bamakande River, you must listen to his message. <laughs> Could you imagine? The policeman gathers the village elders together and he says this, some time ago a man was killed and his body was thrown into your Bamakande River. The crocodiles of this river ate him up and his blood flowed in your river. But before this man died, he left me a message. And his message concerns God's son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who came to this world to save people, to save sinners. He died for the sins of the world and he died for your sins. I received him. I received his message and I beg of you to do the same. And that day, many tribal people came to know Jesus as our savior. To this day, thousands of Mengbetu tribe have come to faith in Jesus and there are dozens of churches in that region because of the man whose blood flowed in the Bamakande River. <laughs> Friends, this is not a game. God does not play games. He does not take risks because risks imply ignorance. God is not ignorant. He is all-knowing. He does not deceive. He does not trick us. He has called us to sacrifice, to deny ourselves for his glory, for his majestic name, to make the little decisions of every day mindful of his concerns. Friends, what would happen? What would happen to the church if we were just mindful of every dis little decision that we made every day? Mindful of God's concerns, it would change the way we spend our time, wouldn't it? It would change the way we spend our money, wouldn't it? It would change the way that we relate to and interact with other people. It would change the way that we meet new people, the way that we do our jobs at work. It would change the way that we view our health, the way that we view our marriages, the way that we raise our kids, the way that we participate in ministries at the church that God has called us to. It would change your prayer life. And I'm telling you, it would change everything. It's a game changer. It's a game changer. Friends, be mindful. Be mindful of the game that you are playing. Because once you have spent your life, you cannot buy it back. God, we need your help. <laughs> we don't want to second guess every decision that we make, but we want to serve you. We want to be mindful every day of the things that we do so that we would please and honor you. And I ask this morning that you would help us in our time of reflection here to consider areas of our lives where maybe we aren't living mindful of you. Maybe our attention has been allured off to other things that do not really matter. We're looking at the GPS device instead of the scenery that you have provided. We're not seeing the things that you have placed in front of us. And God, in our time of reflection here, I pray that you would help us to just take a moment to consider some of the areas of our lives where we might be being mindful of our own benefits and our own concerns this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want to thank you for tuning into our program. It's been a delight to have you. I trust that you understand a little bit more about what Jesus Christ did for you when he died on the cross. Salvation is not something that you receive because you're born into a family or because you go to church or because you're good. Salvation is a free gift, but that gift has to be received. If you have not received it, we'd like to have you take some time to talk to God and ask him that he might be your savior. You understand that you are a sinner, that Jesus Christ died for you, that you can know that you have eternal life by putting your trust in Christ today.